be here today. Well, I, I'm hugely appreciative of the effort that's been put into creating this kind of forum. Um, because as Tony said, it doesn't really exist in, in many places. In terms of uh, my background, so that you know who I am, I, Dr. Jude Smith Kelly, the doctor part of my name comes from a PhD that I did in business and law, and particularly looking at diversity management and how ineffective diversity management strategies have been within businesses. Um, I was very much concerned, as that's an area that I've been involved in for the last 20 years, and I have created a lot of training programs, I've done a lot of consultancy with all sorts of organizations, whether they're big government organizations, multinational organizations, or law firms, um, and I was just getting a little bit concerned that we weren't really seeing changes in outcomes for people when, it, when we're looking at the redistribution of power within organizations and society, when we're looking at the socioeconomic stratification not really changing over time. So that's most recently where my area of specialization is. And, and I do a lot around ethical leadership. I do a lot around looking at how we govern organizations according to human values that should be at the very heart of the businesses that we work within and for. Diversity being one of those core values that a lot of businesses say they have, and which a lot of businesses say that they haven't actually realized. So the organization that I co-founded and am CEO of is called Abundant Sun. You'll see that in the top left-hand corner there. Um, and one of our strap lines is transforming rhetoric into reality. Heard a lot of rhetoric, haven't actually really seen it concrete. So that's our next phase of development. Prior to, um, as you can tell from my accent, I don't come from London. <laughs> um, I'm American. I was born and raised in New Jersey. And um, that's where I did my, my first degree, which was in psychology. So the link to what I have to present to you this afternoon has to do with media, it has to do with health and psychology. So it's just sort of binding all of those things together just to, to paint a bit of a picture. So, um, so that's me in a nutshell. And I will just give you an idea of what we'll cover this afternoon. Um, key topics are five ways mainstream media can reduce your health. We'll look at the links between self-esteem and general health. How mental health impacts physical health. The black girl curse. Effects of the film Dark Girls on the General Public. And lastly, eight activities. Tony had given me the charge of ten. <laughs> but I, yeah, my favorite number is eight, so I like to keep it to that round number there. To promote positive media and self-esteem. So that's what we're going to be doing as we go through. Um, so we'll start with looking at five ways mainstream media can reduce your health. Now it was really interesting thinking about this and doing a little research into it because when we're looking at this whole concept of media, it is something that has become so pervasive in our lives. So if you think in terms of the different media sources that we have available to us every minute of every day, and which are almost on constant stream, we're getting a lot of information that we don't necessarily define for ourselves. Somebody else is defining what's coming to us. So we have, you know, in the olden days, uh, we had newspapers, we had the radio, we had television. But then we're looking at the acceleration of media even over the last five years. You know, you walk around with your mobile phone, you have every imaginable source of media available to you if you've got a smartphone. From Facebook to Twitter to Instagram to all these things that are constantly feeding us with messages, ideas, Images, feelings. It is an onslaught. And do you remember when Blackberries first came around? 
remember what they used to be called their nickname? Anybody? Crackberries. <laughs> because we've become addicted to these sources. And they take over our lives. If you look at, I'm sure they don't have the statistics here, but in terms of young people, this younger generation, whether it's Generation Y or it's Generation Z, they're connected to this. And I have to say to my children, I have to be very clear, this device, wherever mine is, I have to say, this is not an extension of your body. Seriously. Because they just think that they're entitled to hold it and be with it all the time and interact with it. So there's some dangers and precautions that I think that we need to be mindful of. How can it reduce your health? Okay, well, first of all, a crackberry is an addiction, isn't it? I mean, you know, you can get addicted to the media and you can lose the plot within yourself and in terms of your own self-identity and awareness. Um, so here's the first one. There can be a negative impact on how we measure our self-image and standards of beauty. First one, because the media sets it up. Who's rich? Who's famous? Who's beautiful? Who's driving the nice car? Who's got the lovely house? Mm -hmm. What is it towards which we should be aspiring? In order to prove to ourselves and to those around us that we're valuable. And part of that dialogue is about being beautiful. There's a fair amount of research which shows that print people are more likely to get good jobs. <laughs> it's basic, you know. It's a basic prejudice, it's a basic stereotype, but there is something that sits within that, that we've got to be mindful of, and believe me, the media does not help to counteract these messages. So that is what I would suggest to be the first one uh, in terms of measuring self-image and standards of beauty. I, I just I was thinking about um, one of my, my little girls. We were in one of the main supermarkets, and there was a product on the shelf. I was quite surprised because the image on that media of the product was of a little black girl who kind of looked like my kid. And it's not something that you would have seen in the supermarkets when I was growing up. So I was pr pretty pleased and feeling very positive about, well, we have progressed in some ways. We're getting there. And in my positivity, I brought my little girl's attention to this product. Do you know what her response was? And believe me, this is coming from a child whose mother is a diversity and inclusion consultant. You know, I deal with human rights every single day. She said to me, Mommy, who would want to buy that? Well, I didn't give you that message. Somehow or another, and actually I know that your school works proactively to try and be inclusive and deal with all the sorts of multiculturalism. So how did you already, at the age of 10, internalize that that image that you're seeing is undesirable and will not encourage consumer behavior. How did you get that? A pen. Yeah, so those are some of the things. And following on from there, it is about the flavor of the month, uh, what it is to be considered beautiful. Because it's chopping and changing. It kind of keeps to a same standard um, and Generally speaking, we're looking at a very Eurocentric standard of beauty, at least here in, in the UK, and I'm sure as, as you go across into the East and the West, but we'll get there in a little bit. Um, another negative impact of the media can actually be the way in which it glorifies negative behaviors. It's not very positive. I don't know about you, but I really try and not watch TV. And as a matter of fact, as I've grown older, I see it as uh, a poison in my household, <laughs> you know. But I can't stop my kids from what I don't want to be superimposing, you know, because they need to be mindful and make their own decisions. However, there are so many negative things that come through that source. And those negative things become 
kids' aspirations, whether they know it or not. It's something that becomes acceptable. So there's a caution there. And then we have the almighty stereotypes that come out in the media. It's easy with stereotypes to not challenge them. There is no such thing as a positive stereotype, by the way. Because a stereotype, by definition, is making a general statement that every single individual that belongs to a social group is a particular way. Whether you are being defined as a terrorist, whether you're being defined as a good dancer, <laughs> you know, it's a stereotype that limits our ability to see the individual <coughs> within the group <coughs> and to see the individual for his or her own value and self-worth. So media, fantastic at perpetuating stereotypes and fear-mongering and everything else that comes through that. <clears throat> and then the last piece is really in terms of the acceptance of misogyny and violence against women. Uh, that's a huge issue. That's a huge issue. Now, what are some of the lessons that we're giving to, to women in terms of their value? What are some of the lessons that we're giving to young men in terms of how they are to treat women? Is it with respect and dignity? Um, or is it from the point of view of being seen as an object? And there's a lot of objectification of females. Uh, there was mention in the clip that Tony showed you before I came on, um, we're talking about the, the hip hop culture. That is notorious for that bottom bit there. Not all hip hop, right? To be fair, I'm not gonna stereotype hip hop, but there is a prevalence of that element of negativity that comes through that kind of medium. So then we're going to think in terms of self-esteem and general health. And I'm going to have the focus be primarily on female, or women, because it's Queen Yuzinga. I want to honor Queen Yuzinga. Um, but it could also be the impact that it has on men as well. So if we do really give credence to and power to many of the images that are coming forth in the media, then that can also give rise to a sense of dissatisfaction with one's own self. If, in fact, you feel that you do not measure up to those ideals that are out there. And if you can't get there, then one of the long-term effects of this dissatisfaction with self, this inability of self to be perfect, can be one of depression. And I think we all in the room know that you cannot possibly be your brilliant best if you're actually feeling quite depressed about yourself, if you're feeling depressed about your prospects, if you're feeling blank about your future because you can't place yourself in any particular spot within society. <clears throat> um, I'm blessed with three kids and um, I have a son who, who grapples with depression. And we live in a very, um, we live in a rural town in Wiltshire. So there's not a lot of role modeling in terms of Black males, or in his case, he's mixed race male. Um, and he said something to me that was so, um, so powerful. From the point of view of somebody who at the time was only 13 years old. And he's a great teacher. And he said, Mom, 
I can see so well into the lives of other people, but I just can't see into my own. I don't know where I'm, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know where I should be going. You know, and that is partly due to having a sense of self-identity that doesn't fit anywhere out there. Not wholly, but partly. You know. um, so I think that's something that we must be, be mindful of, particularly when we're talking about general health. Um, there's some evidence in terms of a linkage between self-esteem and, and health to obesity. Um, and then on from there as well, you can have other eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa or bulimia. <clears throat> that fourth one, it, you know, we see a lot of that with regards to supermodels, <laughs> don't we? And, you know, that, that's just almost common discussion within the media in terms of those classic images of beauty encouraging that kind of pathologic behavior in young girls as well. <clears throat> and I think it's certainly important to talk about, if, we, if we're having a discussion about general health, it can't just be about our physical health or our mental health. We also have to look at our economic health as well. Because economic stress, right? If you don't fit a particular pattern, you can't get a job that reflects your value and your worth, you can't sustain yourself economically as much as you know you ought to be able to, and then there's this sort of intricate relationship and spiral that can then have an impact, you know, it could lead back into depression or, or other things that come into play. So um, we really need to look at the whole picture and really understand how these things are very, very interconnected. On a chronic level, the perpetuation of this kind of stress can lead to things like heart disease or hypertension. Deeper forms of mental illness, if it goes that far, let's hope that it doesn't. But the potential is there. We'll have a discussion later about cancer as well. That cancer can spring from all of these things. Now, there's quite a strong link between cancer and emotions and, and anger. Um, so, so, from an individual point of view, if one of your emotional responses to feeling alienated or not fitting a particular bill within society of what's valued is anger, then that might actually increase your chances of sliding down that kind of slippery slope when it comes to your own health and well-being on that level. So let's look specific. Has anybody seen this before? The Curse of the Black Girl? No, nor, nor had I. <laughs> Which is why I love being invited to do things like this. Because when you start doing research, you come up against you know all sorts of things. Well, this is this is a real book. You might want to go find it on Amazon.co.uk when we're done. I'm not necessarily plugging him because I do not know who Eric Culpepper is. Um, <coughs> but it is the the, the black the, the black girl curse. And this actually relates to what Tony showed us just before I came on with the, with the other woman who was talking about masculinity and femininity within the black woman. So that's a pretty big statistic. Now this is coming primarily from a US research base. But that research base tells us that 70% of black women are unmarried compared to 45% of white women. That's a significant difference. And that, which I have to share with you, also relates back to the previous video. Because what the doctor was saying there was that we, and even the song that Tony, the music that Tony was playing, as you're all coming into the theater, was all about the black woman saying, I can buy my car, I can buy my house, I don't need you. I'm strong, I'm independent, you know. We have that, so what's, what's that one song? Who is it? Is it, is it? You know it, right? <laughs> so that's that whole storyline 
that we were challenged to really look at critically just earlier on. So it's defined there as a warped concept of strength, masculinity, self-determination, and ultra-feminism. I don't know where that comes from. I don't particularly have it. I mean, I know I have some, L I know, you know, we can all be a bit warped sometimes, um, but it seems quite extreme. Nonetheless, in terms of a myth that's rumbling out there in the media, which is a myth which has been perpetuated by society, it's got to come from somewhere, there is this notion that the black girl or the black woman is indeed cursed. And as a consequence, we either push people away or nobody wants to come near us. Those are our two choices, <laughs> at least for 70% of us. The other 30% are okay. Um, so that's something to, to bear in mind in terms of, well, let's really look at that one critically. What is the relationship that I have to some of those suggestions that are there? Um, so, now there's some impacts, and I put here because I don't believe in it, because I do believe that it is a myth that's out there that's doing nobody any good. But I put in front of all of the potential collapses the word alleged, as a good lawyer would. Because it's not actual, it's alleged. That there's a collapse of the black family because of the black girl curse. It's alleged that there's a collapse of the black industry because of the curse. And of our support basis as well. So when we get to the yeah, end, you know, these are the kinds of things that I think opportunity, uh, opportunities like this are great because it gives us the chance to discuss these things and, and bring them out into, into the light of day, really. Um, in a way that we can take ownership. It's ridiculous. That's sad. <laughs> you know? um, that's not who we are. So it's important to move beyond that. So to the Dark Girls premiere. Anybody in the room there? I know some people. Anybody there? Yes? Anybody else at the Dark Girls premiere? No. Okay. We had quite a phenomenal time, which was only nine days ago. Are you familiar with the film at all? Okay. No. Okay. So let me just give you an idea of why we decided to host and sponsor the UK premiere of this American made film. Um, it's dealing with the issue of colorism, which is by definition discrimination based on your skin tone. So the lighter you are, the more valued you are within society. That's the myth. Um, and Dark Girls is a film that was created by Bill Duke and Dee Chance and Barry, both African-American males, who feel very strongly, and they will tell you this point blank, that, because I was really curious, I was like, why, is men, why as men have you made this film about black women? Why do you keep telling, letting black women tell their stories? I love storytelling, and I just think that that's one of the best ways of sharing information and, and raising awareness and also helping to heal individuals and communities. Well, their main key was that um, they felt that as males, that men have done an inordinate amount of damage to both the female and her psyche and the earth. Two big things, right? And in this day and age, we cannot say no to that, right? We cannot say that. So they then created what is a very, very powerful documentary where they just tear the veneer off of this issue of colorism. 
Um, I'm happy to show you, since many of you haven't seen the film, shall I show you the trailer so that you get a full flavor of it? Yeah. Let's hope our technology is working. Ooh. Rise, dark girls. I can remember being in the bathtub asking my mom to put bleach in the water. Okay. So that my skin would be lighter. If we're all just hanging around and, and a dark skin girl will pass by, we'll be, oh, well, she's pretty for a dark skin girl. Or, and I'm like, well, what is that supposed to mean? I can remember being in the bathtub asking my mom to put bleach in the water so that my skin would be lighter. If we're all just hanging around and, and a dark skin girl will pass by, we'll be, oh, well, She's pretty for a dark skinned girl. And I'm like, well, what is that supposed to mean? I think I remember most saying that, you know, if I, if I had a little girl, I just, I didn't want her to be dark. This is not a phenomenon. It's just the reality in the black culture. I, you know, dark skinned women, I don't, I don't really like dark skinned women. Like, they look funny beside me. The impact that it has on those young children spiritually is that they actually start to devalue themselves in such a way where the spirit begins to shrink. The consequences of not dealing with this issue is that we lay the foundation for future generations of black women to deal with the madness. It becomes the norm for how we see ourselves. One of the most popular products in the third world is skin whitening cream, which gives us a little bit of an idea of how people's perceptions of themselves. I mean, we're talking here about regions of the world where the overwhelming majority are not white. We have a need for each other, a need for someone to show us, to lead us through example. I think it's dangerous to not question things. We need to become the architects of our own self-image. You are the keeper of your own soul. So that is just a preview of the film. Um, it's such a powerful film because it enables women to tell their stories. And it's not just looking at it from an African American point of view. Uh, it's also looking at it from a global perspective as well. <clears throat> so we basically decided that it was something that we wanted to invest our time and efforts into bringing to the UK, simply because that kind of conversation really isn't had in public a lot. Um, it talks about something which is called a brown paper bag test which is the idea that if your skin is lighter than a brown paper bag, then in terms of the classification within the slavery system historically, okay, you need to go sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so it, it speaks in terms of the brown paper bag test and that the classification systems that were part of the, the, the system of slavery. And, you know, that's 500 years ago, but it is astonishing how much the media is still perpetuating that classification, and it is astonishing still how deeply rooted that is in people today. So we had a, we did this at the Museum of London last week, and we had a 230 person, it was a sellout, we probably had about 200 people in the audience in the end, and it was, a, it was full of black women primarily, <laughs> and it was powerful, it was really, really powerful, because people have been hungry for the opportunity to see and to hear the stories of other women. The film itself has been rumbling around for two years in the United States on a sort of fringe circuit. Um, so it was just really important to catalyze and bring this conversation out into the open uh, in, in the UK. And it was a very multicultural group, which was great, although it was predominantly, as I was saying, black women. Um, but it was by far the best diversity awareness training that I have ever created or constructed. The emotions were just fantastic. Um, and the conversations that we had 
post the film, we had a QA and a with G.C. Chansonberry, one of the um, producers, directors. <clears throat> that was really good. And then we had a panel discussion, um, just looking generally at some of the issues that are brought up within the film itself. So the, the effect of the film Dark Girls on the general public, number one, it gave everybody an opportunity to discuss a bit of a social taboo. I am, um, and you'll see in that trailer, they make mention, you know, the one lady is even speaking in terms of wishing that her mother would put bleach into her bath water so that she would become lighter and wouldn't necessarily have to bear the burden of the negative impacts of being perceived as a dark woman with a black girl curse, right? Um, I really didn't have a strong understanding of how much skin whitening products actually prolifer proliferate the global market. Um, uh, that, 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 this has come as kind of quite a horror <laughs> to me. Um, and if we're looking at psychology and media and health, well, the use of skin whitening or bleaching creams, that's pretty dangerous. And there's a lot of it, there's more of it going on than I had ever imagined. But being involved in this project, I found out a lot of stuff. So while this is a film primarily about the African American experience, in reality, when we're looking at media and psychology and health and beauty and skin color and race, it is India that leads the way in this billion dollar global market. And it's Indian women who are pushing hard to be as white as they can possibly get themselves in order to do the body marriage, you know, and then just be seen as. Um, in terms of Africa, Nigerian women, top. Some ridiculous figure like 70% of Nigerian women use this kind of product. So there's a big concern about the psychological health of women, men also use it, but not as much as, and also the physical health. There was, um, actually the day before we premiered this film, in Derby, the, there's a standards agency went into some of the shops in Derby and identified that there were lots of products on the shelves that were just illegal. They get imported in, they don't pass European standards, they're full of mercury, they're full of lead, and women don't care because they want to be light. You know, and they're rubbing this stuff on day in and day out to try and make themselves, apportion themselves to this pathologic definition of beauty. So this is not imaginary, this is very real. And there's also research which is showing that people um, put such products also on their young children. So you're starting out, and the message is very, very young to a little girl about how beautiful she is. And uh, that's hugely damaging. There's one woman in the documentary, beautiful young woman, who says that um, her mother was bragging about her to one of her friends. You know, my daughter's really pretty, she's got great eyelashes, beautiful hair, great cheekbones. And then she sort of ends it saying to her friend, could you imagine how pretty she'd be if she was just a little bit lighter? And when that woman in the film talks about the spirit shrinking, that's exactly what that mother did to the spirit of her daughter. She made it shrink away. Because you see, we're not allowed to just be ourselves and be beautiful. We're always trying to modify, um, which is a challenge. So the effect of the Dark Girls film on the general public one of the great things that arose from it is that there was a real strengthening and celebrating of positive identity and community. You know, as our friends have put these kinds of events together for us, it gives us an opportunity to, to have a space that isn't necessarily created for us just by default within the society in which we live. And that was something that was very real in that room. There was a charge, there was a buzz, there was an excitement, there was a there was a hopefulness, 
you know, and that positive energy that sprang forth, which was fantastic. And clearly, post, it has been about, okay, so what can we do now, you know, now that we've gotten the issue out, now that we're able to talk about it, because before we haven't really been able to talk about it, what do we do positively to try and help change it and continue to empower ourselves as women and men within the community? And that's really, you know, what we hoped for. There was also a positive learning and responses from the overall multicultural community. It was a great exchange because, you know, I, I, and I had a great time, you know, being able to say, well, listen, if we can acknowledge that we have racism within our own black community as a consequence of empire and all these hangovers that we've had from hundreds of years, can we not actually begin to address that racism exists between black people and white people still? Even though you think you're really good white people, <laughs> you know, it's still there. And it was really a powerful lesson for people within the kind of European context to see, you know, they're like, well, how, how has this happened? Do you not know? <laughs> You've created it. You've been so instrumental in creating inferiority and superiority that you can now just step back and let us destroy ourselves. And then you sit there going, yeah, but we're not doing it. How can this be? Well, you were so good. You were so good. And you have to understand that when you're interviewing somebody for a job, you might be colorblind. You might see that everybody's the same and treat everybody fairly. But what you might not understand is what that person's bringing to that interview and that table with them in terms of fear or potential trepidation about how they're going to be seen and will they be valued. Because if you're feeling this way about yourself, you can't present the strength that you are. So that was a great lesson and opportunity to share within a multicultural context, not just a black woman context. And then the other bit, which is a really good win, was that we did the premiere on the Thursday, and by Wednesday morning, I was in the BBC Radio 4 studio on Women's Hour talking about the film and its issues of colorism. That was great. To have nine minutes, I think it wound up being 12 or something, mainstream magazine. Because people just don't know these things. So, excellent. Where it goes from here, I'm not sure. But you can check it online. Um, and, and it's really about what we do as a community. This isn't just a passive learning exercise. But it's what we do collectively and communally to continue to heal those pains or those wounds that might exist. Um, there's the last piece here, which I think is a really important piece. And it's a call to address structural racism and to put this on the UK government's agenda. We had one of our panel speakers was Dr. Rob Barkley, who's the director of the Runnymede Trust. Runnymede Trust is a think tank. It's existed for 45 years to deal with racism in the UK. You know, Rob said really clearly that it's not on the government's agenda. And there was one woman in the audience who also was saying, you know what, it's great that some of the key messages are love your little girls, give them positive self-images, you know, but at the end of the day, she says, I'm not coming here as a wounded black female. I'm coming here as a strong black female. But the reality is when I step outside this door, I still have challenges of structural racism that prevent me from getting on in this society. So it's okay to talk about the healing and the personal development angle of it, but we need to go one or two or three or four steps further to really look at the structural essence of what is still preventing many of us in this room from progressing to, 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 to full potential. That's the best way that I can put it. I was even a little bit miffed with um, Women's Hour, you know, and it goes back to what Tony was saying earlier. I was happy to be on the radio, but I got billed as the organizer. I'm like, well, didn't you see on the write-up that my name is Dr. Jude Smith Rakelli? So maybe, wouldn't it be great if you could refer to me on Women's Hour as Dr. Rakelli, rather than just as Jude the organizer? 
not good. <laughs> not good. And I walked away from that and I said to my husband, how come even when we're winning, it feels tedious? Even when I'm winning, I can still walk away and want to cry. Because you still have to fight. So there are so many issues about it. And whether that's conscious or unconscious bias, it's there. You know? I'm pretty sure it said doctor on, that, on, the, on the paper of the presenter. But maybe when she saw me, doctor and my face just didn't link up. And it got missed out. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Some people say I look like I'm 12. I'm happy about that. But I'm still a doctor. <laughs> Okay, so eight activities that we can engage in to promote positive media and self-esteem. Number one is to support diverse media. I have been so happy doing this project because I have not really been engaged in UK society in this capacity before. And I've lived here for 25 years. But I found all wonderful kinds of magazines that are challenging the status quo of the, of the Eurocentric media that's out there. So I would certainly say, you know, find them, support them. Um, that top image there is from Writers of Color, which is also about Diverse Media UK. They're doing some fantastic stuff. And they're proactive and they're positive. Images below are from Complex Woman magazine. And it's showing the complexity and the beauty of all women, including those who might have the black girl curse, or the fat girl curse, <laughs> or the one, you know, the, the amputee girl curse. I want to be appreciated as a woman. I don't always want to just be seen as black first, and then a woman, if I'm lucky. Right? So, definitely there's some good things out there. Find them. Give kids, definitely give kids positive reinforcement. Love them up, because those messages are out there, and they can start to seep in, and we need to be on the ball, and we need to kind of cut things off at the pass sometimes to protect our kids and make sure they're growing strong. And definitely there are shortcomings in the media. We need to be mindful of what those are, but we also need to be really positive and constructive about how we criticize those shortcomings. And we have to work with that media, not against that media. I think that's one of the key, key lessons in all of this, is to stay in ourselves in that way and be healthy. <clears throat> Mentor young people, because there are a lot of them out there, right? And as I was saying earlier, they are completely consumed by these media sources. And so to help them in that respect, and if you have a campaigning spirit, then campaign for fair representation. If you feel passionately about it and strongly about it, and you have the, the will and the capacity, then that's some great activism. What we don't have enough of is activism. We've been quelled, which is one of the reasons why I brought this film from the States to the UK. I've lived here for 25 years. I have been silenced as in the, because I'm living in a culture where everyone's like, oh, nothing's wrong. No, everything's wrong. <coughs> Let me tell you, okay, just about everything, not everything. But so that whole element of activism and positive sort of, in a sense, you know, being uh, revolutionary and transformative, we lose it a lot, which is why that collective is, is really important. Curb your own negative behaviors that may come. And then lastly, there are charities to get involved with for the empowerment of women and young girls to, to help them combat some of these negative ideas and images that are there. So that's me done. Thank you. Any questions for um, Dr. Rochelle Rakelli? Yes. Because it suggests that if you're married, that's the panacea. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, it doesn't highlight people who are in loving relationships. Indeed. So I just wanted to mention that and find out what you thought. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I mean, there could be some... Um, I, I think they were looking at single in terms of single, not coupled. Yeah, so there is, and I completely appreciate that from the point of view, you can be in a civil partnership, you can be not in a civil partnership, you can, anything. So, 
there is probably more data that could, could paint a clearer picture that's more inclusive, that might not necessarily be so negative. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Also, I think on that point, it assumes that the people who are single are not choosing. Mm. And there are a huge majority of women um, of marriageable age, whatever that uh, is defined to be, who are actually choosing because mm. the quality of the, a lot of our males is so poor, and that's not having to come at the way. Why, but why would you actually choose to, to be married or to be used to that pressure if um, the males aren't kind of up to scratch? You might as well stay on the road. It's not getting any clients. So, so we've got a lot of work to do. That's not supposed to be a bash, but it's just, um, it is a fact. I think that a lot of young women younger than myself are finding a real problem with finding a, a partner. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about, you know, there's something being wrong with us. No, quite right, quite right. There's a very conscious decision in there. Mm. And, and as you say, being married is not the be-all and end-all of one's life. So, yeah, before I do that, there's one back there, yeah. Um, on a similar note, I've just noticed that a lot of the statistics always talk about women. Mm. And I just wondered if that book that you showed mm. also address what percentage of men Men of African descent were single. Yeah, there are there are some um, there are that the, the research will look at gender and and also ethnicity and cut across. Um, and as it's American, it's looking at black, Hispanic, white, and I think Asian in, in primarily. But I mean, yeah. it's percentage for single for single men. Yeah. It's it's quite comparable in each of the ethnic groups. Yeah, yeah, and so it'll be higher. You'll have a higher incidence of uncoupled black men as opposed to uncoupled white men. But again, as we're quite saying, you know, as we're saying, that's quite a limited snapshot. There's more to it than that, for sure. Yeah, um, I'll go right this Yeah, I was just wanted to include the fact that in America, there's a lot of men of African descent that are incarcerated, so they mm. would be excluded as well. Mm. 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 Too many. Mm. Mm. Yes, there's one question down here. Um, you mentioned the, um, the psychological effects linked to cancer. Mm. Um, you touched on it, but you didn't go as deeply into it as I wanted you to. Yeah, and that would have to be for the next talk, because I'm not a cancer expert at all. Um, what I was able to find out in, in doing some, some of the research was, as a, when we're looking at the, the, the black woman in particular, we have less of an incidence of cancer. So we're more prone to heart disease and, and things of that nature as a consequence of chronic stress. But what the research is saying is that we wait too long to actually have it diagnosed or treated so that by the time we get there to some health practitioner, whatever that might be, our actual mortality rate is higher than that of, of people from European or Caucasian background. And that might have to do with a sense of not have, feeling isolated, not knowing where to go. You know, there could be all sorts of other things that are tied into that as an outcome. But yeah, yes. I'm just say, um, I'm assuming the um, uh, Women's Hour was a live broadcast. It's you can get it on um, no, the it, one that the one that you yeah, did yeah, because yeah. I'm just saying that I think it would have been a very powerful moment had you corrected her on air. I, you know, <laughs> and and there is a politic because I had a friend who. who knows the lady. So, do you know what I mean? You have to constantly be like, um, thank you. <laughs> you know? But actually, I want to be able to say, but what I did, you know, I did go to the person who organized and said, um, can you change that? And they said, oh, you know, the next time we'll make sure, you know, if you're on, we'll say Dr. Kelly. I'm like, well, okay, but I, I know what you mean, but um, it, when you find yourself in those situations, I was so taken aback. Yeah. Do you know, what, you know, you found that? And you think, oh, I should have said this, or I should have done that, but I was like, oh, 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 oh. You know, just getting kind of passed over and demoted. I was demoted. <laughs> so yes, last question. Oh, I'll get it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did the statistics talk about divorce rates compared to white people getting divorced and black people getting divorced? Yeah, it looks at yeah. And what was the comparable comparison there? Were we. Uh, it's still skewed. Rate? Yeah, it's still skewed in the same direction. 
Uh, there's one question down here. Yeah, I just wanted to say I work in child protection, mm -hmm. and um, because of domestic violence, mm -hmm. a lot of the women are left on their own with the children yeah. because the husband <coughs> has to leave the house or maybe in prison mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. So that would have to be statistics. Yeah. We black single women. Which also connects to your point about incarceration of the black male. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is linked potentially to some of those other negative impacts of, of media on people's behavior or not. Mm. One last question. Oh, no, you got a bit more time. Oh, I do? Okay. Uh, yes. One question, absolutely quite right in terms of, you know, we have to look at positive media that is diverse and reflective and dispense with things that are giving the wrong messages to the kids if they're not connected to it or identified with it. Either make up your own stories, as you, as you do, or find stories that will reflect them, you know, even if it's about animals, you know, it's better than if it's about animals, but, you know, not necessarily that having the cultural connection to is important. Yes, um, I, I was at the, the, the this, this screening yes. and in the discussion after with, with a couple of other people I met there, I was really surprised that nobody in the discussion or from the platform mentioned the, the thing in, because in, in connection with health and mental health mm. and the whole in, in sort of the, the, the Trayvon Martin thing. It was recently that the guy in America, in the, the Marine, who killed all those people. Yeah. And they said it was linked to mental health. Mm. And I'm really surprised that more of a link isn't made mm. between, because black people in general, the black men in particular, grew up with so much yeah. pressures and the whole yeah. thing about masculinity. And then we saw the, a film yesterday at the, the, the BFI, Nothing But a Man. And it shows the pressures that, that, that yeah. can build up with a black male. Yeah. And I am surprised that more of them who are, have access to resources don't do because a lot of harming goes inwards. Mm. A lot of anger, mm -hmm. the, the harm that comes out of anger goes into the, your own community, into your own family. The, the woman mm. there mentioned domestic violence mm. or riots or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But also the situation where, okay, I've had enough of this and we're going to take the whole lot to do. And I'm just amazed that it doesn't happen more often. And you know, all the discussion around the, um, the Marine thing and the trade one market thing, I haven't heard that link made. And I think it's part of the expression of, of, of what we, we, I think most people know it, you know. The, the, the film says absolutely nothing new to most people. Mm -hmm. What it has done is to articulate it, yeah. I, I think. Yeah. And there was also uh, stuff that uh, Tony has done here around reparations. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about reparations, it, it's that long-term insidious damage that has to be repaired through institutions and structurally that needs to be addressed. And I think the, the opportunity to make those links is, 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 what, is what's really helpful. Yeah, yeah I agree. And, and taking that, that completely you know, holistic approach to looking at it from those dimensions. Um, interestingly, when I was coming into to London the evening of this, the morning of the screening, I was with Chan, who's the producer, 
um, and we were talking about the incident with the um, <clears throat> with the marine, and you know, he just said, "People are on the edge. People are on the edge. You know, we are on a mental health edge." I know I have my moments, you know. <laughs> I got my moments, and and we need to be able to address it. And I think that also comes back to being able to acknowledge our humanity. But if you don't have the conversations about it, then you're just dehumanizing the next person, writing off that you know it's their pathology. It has nothing to do with society. Um, it definitely needs to come out for sure. Thank you. Anybody else? I must say that um, if you go to certain towns in, in England, like High Wycombe, um, there are a proliferation of young marriageable black women there. But the black males, because I think such a good job has been done of um, diverting his attention that when it comes to a partner, mm -hmm. um, so it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with those women and they're actually wanting to have relationships <coughs> with black men but like the young man said on the on the film he just wouldn't most of them are just not seeing yeah. black women as um as an option part of the choice yeah exactly so we have to be just as robust because yeah. our sister just said this is a very old thing yeah uh, it's it's been very um steeped in our uh, in all the generations, mm -hmm. and certainly I work in schools with young people with uh, my organisation, which is Reclaiming Minds, mm -hmm. to really try to turn that round. And when we were talking to a lot of the young black guys about this whole thing around image and everything and the women that they liked, um, they, it came out that most of the women that they liked and would like for a partner were those light skinned women and so we had a whole discussion around that mm -hmm. and how insidious really that is. Because our children are, are subject to those images sometimes they're very small. But it's our responsibility mm -hmm. first and foremost not to look for any organisation. We have to be that organisation. Yes, we have true. to be the ones almost to brainwash our children or to Or just to educate them. That we want to them. Them the same yeah. Yeah. Um, Admire. Yeah, and, and there is definitely, um, in terms of the, 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 the book that um, I've made reference to, there's a piece in there about um, the increase of, of mixed race marriages in the States more recently and how actually black women get missed out on that mixing. Right, so for whatever reason, it's going in this direction, it's going in an Asian direction, it's going in a, in a European direction. So it's there across cultures in many ways. But absolutely, the, the, the point is, as I was saying earlier, what do we do? How do we actually collectively organize ourselves to move this forward so that, that um, you know, we've got that dignity and respect? So, yes, Mr. Cameraman. Yeah, also, I mean, you know, um, I, just, I, just, I have a lot of female friends, I've got a lot of dark-skinned female friends, and a lot of things that they've said is, is that, they, you know, they've grown up through some verbal bullying from their own families, especially if they've got a light skinned family and they're the only dark one in the family. Um, they, they go through some hell yeah. from the whole family. And then they go to school and they catch hell. And what some of them have actually said to me is that they're not interested in any black men, they want a white man so, have, so they don't have dark skinned children. Yeah. And that's some of what comes out mm. in, in the film. Or, or okay. the mother has said to them, do not marry anybody darker than yourself. Yeah. 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 So there's some powerful messages, and again, this was about psychology, media, and... Just, just to follow up on, on what the woman was saying earlier, and that one, is, you know, there is a horrible point when you realize that you alone, no matter how right on you are and how Afrocentric you are, a this is going to come in your family when you realize your children it didn't quite get the message, mm -hmm. even when you think they have. And I, it, for me, it was a huge shock, and therefore it cannot be something that is resolved only within the family. However, you define the family. Yes, it's important, but it's one part of something much bigger and much more intricate. And therefore, that the family, however it's defined alone, cannot solve it. And that's my position now. Last question from Abby. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that actually, because it is more than just a family. Because my nephew said to me one day, 
I hate black boys, and he's a black boy. So it's, mm. and, our, and our family has instilled in him pride in his, his self and all of that, but yet he hates black boys. My and nephew, who, whose father is Nigerian, born and grew in Nigeria, said to me when he came here at 19 to go to university, said, said to my daughters, because they were a bit younger than he was, see, he, he would not go out with girls dark, uh, 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 even as dark as him, nor with any of his friends. I was shocked. Um, not that he had the idea, that he said it very openly yeah, in public. Yeah, yeah. And then I realized that was only because he had just been here for weeks. And this is somebody who was born and grew up in Nigeria. Yeah. You know, his father is, is darker than me, his mother is darker than me. There is a, there's something on BBC Africa uh, that I came across which is you know, black people in Africa saying they don't like black. Yeah. So if you check it, Google BBC Africa, and you'll see it's it's there. It's it's all part of that that new discussion. I have a question to finish up. Um, yeah. What was the reaction of your sponsors when they saw Full House for Black Men and their reaction to the film? What did they say about your work and the film itself? Um, the the key sponsor was uh, international law firm that we work with. We do diversity uh, consultancy and training with them, and. Um, one of their partners was with us on the evening, a uh, Dutch man, uh, Moritz Dolmans. They were so pleased with the evening. They just, and, and they're passionate about it. I mean, the, the diversity committee that exists within the firm is, is very rich in terms of people's backgrounds. Um, but um, they, they, were, they were absolutely delighted to have supported it, and, and I'm sure they look forward to more, because it is, it's the direction that it needs to go. And I know, as I know from a personal point of view, uh, he is a partner. He is, is hugely committed to the agenda, to the human rights agenda. Um, so it was it was a plus. And credit to him for going on stage as the only white guy up there. You know? <laughs> He's like, I'm nervous. You know? um, so yeah. Listen, thank you, everyone. I'm going to have to disappear because I, I have to catch a um, back to Wiltshire. Um, thank you for coming to me here. And I look forward to the next time. So take good care and enjoy the rest of the evening.